This is the Wisdom Podcast. Welcome to the Wisdom Podcast. I'm Daniel Aiken, and in this episode of the podcast, I had the pleasure of interviewing author and Wisdom Academy teacher, Venerable Bhikkhu Analio. In this rich discussion, we talk about understanding self-reliance and the Buddhist tradition, and examine structural elements and meaning in the memorization process of the suttas. We also discuss the records of the Buddha's teachings and their transmission through time, and the idea of coherence when approaching the Pitakas. There's so much more, and I really hope you enjoy this episode. One question I had was that the Buddha didn't have a successor. And so why do you think that was the case? Because normally when you think of um, traditions carrying on the teachings of their, you know, teacher. Normally, a successor might be appointed. This wasn't the case. So, why was that? And then, what were some of the strategies that stood in place of that? Well, I, this is a very interesting question. You see, the whole the whole image of the student-teacher relationship in early Buddhism is quite different from what we get in later times. And there is a major emphasis on becoming self-reliant. The Buddha, in the way he is described in the text, was not really establishing this kind of dependency relationships. There's even like... Is his own preferred uh, meditation practice, mindfulness of breathing, according to the text. And then there's this scene where he's described as meeting this monk and asking them if they are practicing mindfulness of breathing. And one says, yes, yes. And then he describes a practice which has really nothing to do with the way it's normally taught in early Buddhism. And the Buddha is shown not to have any problem with that. He's just saying, well... This is a way of doing it, but let me show another way of doing it. So this whole idea of what we have very strong, I think, in Theravada and Mahayana traditions of this streamlined way of teaching and the teacher tells you exactly what kind of meditation to practice and how to do it, and your job is to exactly execute it and follow every single step and you get all time closely supervised yeah. and checked at every step, This is something that has come into being only later times. And the Buddha as a teacher in the way he emerges from the early discourses is someone the much larger hands over responsibility to others. And I think the most powerful scene is when it's in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta and its parallels. Buddha is close to death, but at that moment he was not yet dying, but he was already like seemingly dying. And Ananda was really worried. He said, and oh my God, and what are we going to do? And when the Buddha recovers, and Ananda says, oh, I was so worried, and I just thought, well, at least he won't pass away before he has settled, uh, said something, what's going to happen after mm-hmm. his death. Yeah. And the Buddha says, oh, what, are, what are you expecting? Be self-reliant. Mm-hmm. Take refuge in your mindfulness practice. Mm-hmm. And so for the Time after the Buddha's passing away is the teachings in general and in particular for the monastics and the code of rules mm. that, 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 that stands in, in, the, in the place of, of authority mm. and which ensures the continuity of, of, of the tradition much rather than an individual person. Mm. And in view of the Problems that we see in Buddhism from ancient to modern times. We have many cases here now in the modern times with teachers abusing their authority, doing things that are not at all proper, or even just seeing how students get into all kinds of dependencies. I think there's really a point in seeing that this kind of model of a very close teacher-student relationship and monitoring. It has its advantages, I'm not denying that, but it's not the only possible model. And there's another model that, in a way, 
expresses expresses is not quite the word I'm looking for manifests inculcates calls up those essential qualities that uh, the teachings are themselves about about independence mm. the whole idea of meditation practice is to become more independent mm. of defilements of condition of or conditionings whatever and so a way of teaching that inculcates this attitude mm. that does not create dependencies is is more aligned with where it's uh, wanting to lead to but of course this then brings us to the topic of the reliability of the teachings in general and of the monastic code of rules and this is precisely what the, the book that we are discussing now is actually about how reliable i mean do we know what the buddha taught mm. and i get that question quite often and i have to say uh, no mm. i'm sorry we do not know exactly what the buddha taught we have a fairly high degree of probability about the topics he taught mm. we have complete certainty about certain topics he did not teach which later tradition attributed to him whether this is abhidharma or bodhisattva path or whatever but the exact precise words in which the buddha as a historical person living in india 2500 years ago would have said something are beyond reach mm. these have been passed on for centuries by all transmission and with all the efforts made by the reciters it's simply not possible for them to transmit things with absolute accuracy mm-hmm. and so we cannot say uh, like said say we can say of course the buddha must have taught impermanence uh, dukkha not self emptiness mm-hmm. he must have taught dependent arising he must have taught uh, the five aggregates uh, uh, the four satipatthanas <coughs> but the exact precise words in which he did that are beyond reach mm. and this is i think uh, something difficult for pretty much all buddhists to swallow because as i <laughs> showed in my book on superiority conceit mm. in buddhist traditions which is already been published by wisdom there is uh, one thing on which all traditions agree that is the pretense yeah. <laughs> that they are the only ones yes. who got the buddha's words yeah. exactly and truly right yeah and i must say to all of them including the early buddhists yeah. i'm sorry we can't be sure mm. of course we know say the buddha vatangsaka sutta this is we we are certain the buddha did not teach that yeah but what he actually taught we have a high degree of probability about the topics but the words are beyond reach mm. and so all these attempts to construct a fundamentalism in one way or another and this feeling that my tradition got it right and the others got it wrong uh, this is severely undermined by the actual state uh, of the situation of the textual sources we have mm. the only testimonies mm. for the early period because archaeological evidence comes in only later yeah we are talking about textual sources the discourses mainly and some of the vinaya material but mainly the discourses the nikaya and agama discourses well we have different recital lineages we can compare and we can say okay where well, they agree this is probably early where they disagree we can say like may this may be earlier this may be later but the consensus that we can arrive at at the very best takes us to about let's say king ashoka yeah about 200 years after when the buddha would have lived and we are now really this is hazy exact numbers in ancient india is difficult <laughs> but just just to say something so what 200 years later people thought the buddha said mm. and those 200 years nothing written everything mm. oral yeah they were much better than we are nowadays in memory they had their systems and they had their things to improve uh, transmission but still it cannot be an exact replica yeah so that's the that's the closest we can get that's our situation that's this the, the reality situation. that's the reality yeah so i'm thinking you know this idea of self reliance is an important idea in the 
teacher-student relationship. And it's important to note that it's not as if the Buddha didn't have options. We hear about students who are awakened. So he had options to say, okay, here's my successor. Here's someone who's awakened. But he chose not to. And I think that's because it could be someone might think that, oh, the, it was just the Buddha. He was the only awakened one. So now we have to listen to his words and there was no other options. That wasn't the case. And so with students walking around India, for example, I imagine, and teaching, because they were teaching as well. How does someone then know that this teaching is correct? How, how do they verify when they hear it? You know, in India, when, even when the Buddha's alive or shortly after the Buddha's alive, how, how, does, how do we think the disciples who are listening to a teacher that was connected with the Buddha, how would they be confident that this was actually the teachings of the Buddha? And then you mention in the book, you know, shortly after the Buddha died, you know, there's a, mo- there's a monk that reportedly says, oh, g- now I can relax. <laughs> I can relax the rules. And everyone sort of said, hey, wait a minute, we need to, we need to talk about this. <laughs> so there's a couple of questions there, but um, two, is, two in terms of how, how could they have confidence at the time and shortly after the death of the Buddha, the passing of the Buddha? And then if we could talk a little bit about this monk who decided he could relax. <laughs> Maybe I start with the monk who yeah. decided to relax and then we go to the other one. So the, this is a narrative uh, that explains how the first Sangiti uh, was held. Sangiti is often translated as a council, but I think this is a bit misleading translation because it was not so much a, an area of doctrinal debate between different sects or whatever, but it was a recitation, a communal recitation. And of course, again, we don't know what actually happened, but the idea, the basic idea that the Buddha had just passed away, many had come together for the funeral. Mm -hmm. And so for them to um, be reciting the text they know makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And also, as long as the Buddha was alive, there was a continuous production of new text, of course. Mm -hmm. Like say, you were in that part of India and I'm in another part and I just heard something the Buddha said, and then five months later I meet you and say, hey, Daniel, listen, the Buddha just taught this, and I give you that discourse and you memorize it. This this whole process of the giving teachings by the Buddha and the main disciples and then spreading slowly over the other parts of India would have come to a closure. So it would have been a meaningful thing for them to say, let's all recite what we all know, and then we have a reference point. And the different Vinayas agree that at that time already that was like they made like four major divisions because there was so much text. So they said, okay, let's put the very long discourses together, the middle long, and the short ones we can divide them according to topic and according to numbers. Again, there's no way for us to be sure what actually happened, but it seems a fairly reasonable scenario. Not a canon, not something fixed. Tradition itself recognizes that still text came in later, but just this basic idea. And the narrative there about this monk is significant in so far as the Sankiti was actually predominantly about communal harmony. And this is exactly the problem when the person of authority, the Buddha, who in the text on monastic discipline functions as the lawgiver, the one who gives the laws and can adjust them, if he is no longer there, then some people might feel like, hey, why don't we just do what we want? And whether this really happened or not, but this this idea that the tradition created through the Buddha would fall apart because of everybody doing what they want, and so there needs to be a common reference point. Mm -hmm. And I think for that, the recitation of the Code of Rules would actually have been more central than the actual discourses. So the recitation, the Sangiti of the discourses would have been secondary. And so at that time, there's this this whole group of respected uh, people, and then this role given to Ananda as the attendant of the Buddha and the one who has been with him most of the time to sort of like act as a as a sort of authority of verification, saying this is... This is Evang Mesutanistan, as I heard, this is uh, Ananda recites all of these together. And 
But already at the time of the Buddha, then there was always the question, of course, of some stories being said about him that were not accurate. But at his time, then you could go there, you know, could say, Bhante, I heard you are teaching this and this. And then he would he could say, yes, this was teaching. No, I never said that. Mm-hmm. And there's a number of such occasions in the early discourses, usually not Buddhist disciples, but more like others, outsiders or other mm-hmm. people who come and say, I heard you say such and such. And then he would say, no, I never said that. Yeah. So this is a basic problem in any oral society that you always need to verify. Yeah. And why it is so important to have a personal meeting with the person. Like I meet you in person, I say, Daniel, they told me you said this and this. Is this true or yeah. not? You know, so this is something quite repetitive. But then with the Buddha no longer being there, there is this, this is scheme of our authorities. It's called the Four Great Standards. And it's, it's just like saying... Uh, I heard this from uh, a whole group of well-known, respected monks, monk reciters, or I heard at least from one. And so there's this uh, gradually going down in authority. So say if you would have met Ananda personally, and you could come and say, hey, Ananda, Ananda told me such and such, I wouldn't be able to ask any questions because that's such an authority. Yes. So there's this this, this question of of, of, uh, the authority of the sources of the text you learned. But perhaps more important, there's always this, and this is also in these four great uh, standards of authority, Mahapadesa, this question of does it fit with the rest? Mm. Because there is, um, and this is one of the difficulties of the early Buddhist teachings, that there is an underlying system is the wrong word, an underlying interconnectedness of and congruence and coherence of ideas. Coherence was a criterion of truth in the ancient setting. So if you say something and then you say something else and that contrast with the first one, I can challenge you. I can say, look, Daniel, you said you were going to speak according to truth. What you said first now doesn't match what you said later. What you said later doesn't match what you said first. Mm -hmm. There's an incongruence there and that, that doesn't work. So... This principle of coherence as a verification truth criterion is relevant, and there is an inner coherence in many of the teachings and the interlace. But the problem is you have to have really good acquaintance with the whole corpus of textual material to get a feeling for that. Yeah. Because every discourse is just a particular teaching in a particular setting to a particular person, Mm -hmm. and it will just take out one part and it will usually be addressed specifically to the needs of the audience at that time. Mm. And so you, you, you need to bring all this together and you get a sort of, a kind of network of ideas and then you get something new and you, you can simply see how much does it fit with yeah. the rest. There's an internal integrity. An internal integrity, yeah. And because of the nature of orality, there are also some discrepancies there. Mm. Some, and this is precisely how we can easily recognize when something is probably later edition, because it's not so fully, fully coherent. Mm. I just came across one, it's just a very small example. Uh, it's in the Madhyama Agama version of the Sakapanya Sutta, the discourse uh, on the question of the king, the celestial king Saka. And so, in all versions, they talk about the path that a monk practices to get rid of defilements or whatever it is. And in the Manyamaga version, there is an addition. It says the path that lasts only for um, one moment. Hmm. And this is an influence of the doctrine of momentariness. Yeah. But the doctrine of momentariness actually is a radicalization of the uh, teaching on impermanence that only manifested openly after the closure of the Abhidharma mm. period. It's quite late. Yeah. But somehow somebody reciting the sutta and liking this idea of momentariness just had to, couldn't let the occasion pass and put that in. Yeah. But when you read the whole sense, it totally fails to make sense. Yeah. Because the path that is being discussed here cannot be only for one moment. It just, but they had to kind of like squeeze that, that, that little thing in there mm. that lasts only for one moment. And this is just, uh, I just came across this very recently, 
uh, it's just one example on how you can see that something doesn't fit with the rest of the, yeah. the thought world of, of the discourse. You can very clearly see, I mean, apart from the fact that this discourse, I don't remember how many versions we have, but we have kind of like several different versions from different recital lineages. They all agree only this one has this statement and the statement fails to make sense. So it's, uh, there's two, there's two things happening. One, it's not, it's in one version of the, the accounts And two, it doesn't, it's not part of the internal consistency of exactly. what's being taught. Yeah. And so it seems that often when things are added, not only you, do you not see them in other editions, they stand out because they don't fit, be, because they, it's not consistent with, with the rest of the teaching. And then if it fits, then... Some of them fit yeah. and we can't say anything. Yeah. But I just want to be uh, careful that we do not start to valorize only early is good and mm. all later is bad. Yeah. Because uh, precisely those uh, later editions are fascinating because they make us understand the development of Buddhist thought, yeah. you see? Yeah. It's not all about just uh, a recovery of the pure original and everything else yeah. is later deviation, not at all. It's more... And here I come, this is, this is my own upbringing. As a, as a child, I was very much into uh, evolution of species and searching mm. for fossils. Yeah, yeah. And I love this, like you break open a stone and you get this fossil and you try to see <laughs> how many million years ago. And when later I was doing my academic work, my, whenever I made a, some finding, like yeah. the one I just shot, my mother would always say, oh, my boy has found another <laughs> fossil. Because that same kind of like, There's this fascination of understanding developments mm -hmm. from that little molecule, then it becomes like this, like this, and then this, this animal changes into this animal, and the same in, in, in with, with the comparative study of the text, you know. We see there's first this idea, and then they bring in this momentariness, and this comes out of the momentariness, and then the momentariness creates this kind of problem, and they come up with a storehouse consciousness yes. in order to explain continuity. It's not that right and wrong, it's the fascination of understanding historical developments. Yeah. And then being able to, 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 to position ourselves as practicing Buddhists within that framework. Yeah. See, the, oh, this idea comes from here, the body scan. I really like body scan. I teach body scan, but yeah. it's not in early Buddhism. Yeah. But I found out how it developed. Oh. And I think this is just lovely for me to know mm. where this, how this, this idea, what interpretation, how it moved and how it became the body scan. Mm. Yeah. Because there's something to learn as new developments come up. What was the problem they were trying to solve? Exactly. And from there, if you understand, oh, here, here's, what, here's a problem they were trying to solve, there's insight that comes along with that. So if you look at, like, storehouse consciousness, what was the problem they were trying to solve? Oh, continuity of consciousness. Exactly. In, in a world where everything is momentary. Exactly. Oh, now I can, now I can look at this in different angles. Exactly. And what does this tell me about my mind? Yeah. And you can go either way. Go keep yeah, going yeah. with that story. Yeah, yeah. Or come back to another story that was about, you know, a different way of understanding impermanence that's not momentary. Yeah. So this is this is an insight practice in a way. Exactly. This, this insight into what? Insight into reality, actually. Into into conditionality. Con conditionality. Yeah. 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 Reality, but conditionality. Conditionality. It's seeing the conditions, yeah. the cause and conditions. This is mm. who sees conditionality sees the Dharma. Mm. Famous statement. Yeah. It's insight into conditionality. Mm. Mm. This is the teachings. This is what yeah, the teachings yeah, are all about. This is what it's all about. Yeah. Seeing things as processes mm. determined by certain conditions. Mm. Exactly. Momentariness comes up. It feels really good because it's a strong statement of impermanence. Yes. But there's a problem, continuity. Yeah. Hey, stores consciousness. Yeah. Understanding that stores consciousness means to, 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 to fill that gap and present a continuity, we also understand how it sometimes overstates that yes. continuity. Yeah. Conditions. Yeah. This is exactly. This is so nice. And so just getting back to the book, and I'm thinking... So recitation became really important as a means of verification of the teachings. And particularly, it seems, in the monastic code. And so that was really important that that was accurately recorded 
And I like the point you're making is that it's, it's one way you think about it as a council, but really it's people coming together and reciting something as an act of verification. Sangeeti, Sangeeti reciting yeah. together. Yeah. So this is an important point, I think, to think of these um, gatherings as gatherings of re uh, reciting the Buddha's teachings and the monastic code in particular, which became very important. And so you make a point in the book that there's two modes of uh, recounting in a way. One that's very strict and wants to be very accurate and very precise. That's to do with the rules and conduct. Whereas the stories around how those rules developed, the, the teacher has a little bit of uh, flexibility to get the message across. And so could you talk a little bit about those two modes of verification and recitation? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, 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 the code of rules needs to be recited every fortnight in the monastic community. Mm. And if you are, no, let us just assume you're also a monk and we are a group of monks and one of us recites it, then this is an expression of communal harmony that all of us are dedicated to following these rules. In fact, if you have broken any of them, you should you have to either originally during the recitation say, wait a moment, or later before that you have to confess it. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are actually, by our silent participation in that recitation, we are manifesting our purity mm -hmm. and our commitment to live according to the standard. If the rules are being recited are different from the ones that you took, there's a problem there. Yeah. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So for the functioning of the monastic community uh, to have the same set of rules is, is, is absolutely crucial. Yeah. It's quite a different situation now when, for example, let me assume I am a teacher and you have just ordained mm -hmm. and you are now uh, in a group of young, young ordained monks and I want to teach you about the rules and I start with the most important ones, those rules that... If you break them, you're no longer a monk. So let's say killing or sex, having sex. At that point, my job is to really make it very clear to you that this is important, you don't break that rule. Mm. So whatever story I heard from my ancestors in the monastic tradition about how this rule come about, if I embellish it a little bit here and there, if I make it a little bit more dramatic, yeah. I get the message better across. Yeah. And so this is very natural that we find in this promulgation stories, we find a lot of like embellishment, exaggeration, stories become more and more and more and more dramatic. And that same pattern is something we already know from ancient India between like a fixed text and the story that goes with mm. it. It's also for verses and the stories that go with them. And it's eventually also for like a discourse what the Buddha actually was believed to have said, and then the narrative that leads to that. Yeah. There is much more freedom in the narrative to, 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 to adjust to the situation, because as a reciter, that's my responsibility. I'm not just a tape recorder, but I am actually there. I have to look at the audience, and I have to negotiate between the text and the audience, and this negotiation takes the form of a commentary. Mm. I explain something. If I would say now some word and I see from your face that you don't understand and I have to stop what I'm saying say, ah, this means that. Like mm. earlier I said, Sangiti, what yeah. Sangiti really means. Mm. So the ancient reciters had to do the same thing. They had to explain things to the audience. And these commentaries then uh, develop a life of their own. If my story of the rule against killing and sex was very juicy, <laughs> or if the explanatory comment I just gave on Sangiti was very helpful, then when you start to mm. teach that to the next generation, you will use those same stories yeah. or you will use that explanations. And so that commentary becomes something more, more fixed or more is being reused more yeah. and more. It comes closer to the original. Yeah. But the problem is that even with the original, you cannot get total accuracy. Mm. That's simply a drawback of oral transmission. The reciters of the Vedic texts in ancient India, they had a very high degree of precision. But that was because they started when they were very young, at six years old, and they learned to memorize what they did not understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is... When you memorize something that you don't understand and you're trained in memorization, your reproduction of the text achieves a higher degree of accuracy. Yeah. 
But as soon as you understand, because our way of remembering is by drawing inferences, yeah. we are changing it yeah. unavoidably. And uh, I mean, I have had that myself. Uh, it was soon after my higher ordination in Sri Lanka. I had memorized the Code of Rules in Pali. And so we went to, for the, uh, this uh, ceremony. And even though the uh, head monk was actually using a written copy, there must have been some mistake because he mispronounced one word and it made no more sense. Mm. And after that recitation, I went back with my friend. I said, look, he made a mistake. You know, my friend, he just looked at me like, who are you? <laughs> it's like, like, as if, uh, I mean, mm. and I could have taken the book and shown him, yeah. but in a situation where there's no book, if the highest respected reciter has a memory uh, slip, which can easily happen, just maybe forgets one word or changes one word, who is going to say this is wrong? Yeah. So if it's a small um, difference, then even though you are not used to that, during the recitation, it just moves by. You know, It's just one word. You don't pay so much attention. Yeah. But when it becomes like a really substantial different thing, there comes a point at which you will no longer feel comfortable mm. at my recitation. Yeah. You feel that this is actually different. And I might even, I mean, let's say I might even come up with a new rule that you've never heard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Extreme case. And so in this way, we get different monastic lineages because this is also then geographically. Mm. In, 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 you stay in a, that area, I stay in this area. Maya, they recite it like this. In that area, they recited like that. It's even one thing we have still nowadays in the Theravada tradition. When we get, when we take a, a ordination, the first the novice ordination, we have to recite the refuges in two different ways. Mm. Uh, because there's, you know, I can recite Buddham Saranam Gachami or Buddham Saranam Gachami. Mm. It's the same letter. Yeah, but either you pronounce it as M or as Ng. Yeah. And you have to do the whole thing. Dhammam saranam gachami. And then again, Dhammam wow. saranam. And they are very careful. They, they really look like you don't um, do um. Yeah, that you do it rightly. And you do it all three refuges three times. Otherwise, the ordination ceremony is invalid. Is this because the um, way of writing that is vague? Is this come no, from no, a written the, the, the written is completely clear. Oh, okay. It's the same. It's just a question of how you want to pronounce it. Yeah. And the Buddhang is, is actually the correct way of pronouncing it. But for some reason, this alternative pronunciation came up mm. because this is an ecclesiastical act and it has to be valid. Mm. We have to make sure that this uh, difference in pronunciation is taken care of. So you do it first, once the whole thing in one pronunciation, then the whole thing in the second pronunciation. Yeah. To, just to make sure. Well, covering... Covering, covering all bases. the case and making sure that actually the ordination I'm receiving is, is valid. Valid. Well, there's a lot here. So we've been talking about recitation and making, you made this point that um, the recitation of the rules is accuracy is important. Whereas the recitation of the stories around how the rules came about, what's important here is the impression they make and the impact they make. Whereas the um, rules have to be accurate because that's what you've got to live by. But you're also pointing out that oral transmission has, um, there's, there can be cases where things get changed, not with intention, but through the act of recitation, things might get changed, especially when there's authority in place that cannot, that might not be uh, questioned in a situation. So then it seems as though different sort of transmission lineages could be organically created without intention. Is this your understanding of how different, monastic codes came about or how do you account for different recitation lineages basically and i think this is a central principle in the coming to existence of the different nikayas the different schools i don't think that we have like uh, so and so many individual instances of intentional schism because yeah. of some doctrinal divergence I think it's much more that uh, there, there's a more natural development, uh, like the evolution of species. Yeah. And I do not want to exclude intentionality completely. I think I make the point in my book that there is a place for intentionality. I'm not denying intentionality. But I say that, uh, particularly for us used to the written word, 
and the editor making this change in my manuscript, it's natural to default to intentionality. And when we default to intentionality, we miss out much of what orality is about. We actually have to get into a different worldview. A worldview. That is my point. A worldview where oral transmission is is considered quite um, having a lot of integrity. The Ve- the Vedic yeah. uh, system had ways of ensuring that oral transmission worked. And you make the point in the book that the Chinese pilgrim, I can't remember his name, Fajin, came and he's looking for a particular Vinaya text that he can take back to China and translate. And actually he's in North India and he's struggling to find the yeah. text because why? Because they're recited. They re- this, this community relies on recitation. They have so much um, confidence in recitation. Yeah. This is a different worldview to us who need something written down yeah. for it to be safe. Yeah. But we, we back then, this worldview is it's being recited every two weeks or, or whenever. This is safe. And so someone who comes looking for a text to take back home so they can translate it is struggling, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And also because the recitation is something communal. Mm-hmm. It's not individual. Yeah. It's the, the Western uh, ideal is the individual. Mm-hmm. And the Asian, and particularly ancient Indian idea, is really the group. Mm-hmm. Uh, recitation is carried by the group. The whole group gives it, uh, 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 authenticates it. Mm-hmm. As an individual, you can, you can do anything, but yeah. as part of the group, you can't. Mm-hmm. So for many, even centuries, writing had come into use. They were not using it, mm-hmm. like with Fashian, for, for certain texts because they were more confident in its oral performance. And so, yeah, this is a different worldview than we're used to. Yeah. This is a worldview where we're more confident in the coming together and recitation than, you know, writing it down in a book that can, you know, copying books there's mistakes as well. So this also shapes the sutra. So having read your book, now I, when I read a sutra, a sutta, I feel different about what I'm reading because I understand why it's in this form. Yeah. So this idea of waxing syllables, for example, yeah. can you talk a little bit about what that is and the role? Well, they have uh, different ways of structuring things in a way that it's easy to memorize them. Mm. And so one typical thing is this repetition. Mm. Uh, Like they will say one thing, not one time, they will say three or four words for the same thing. And when you have these three or four words in order to make it easy to remember them, they order them according to how many syllables it has. So that there's like a continuity. This is a kind of rhythm to to to, to the recitation. And another thing is what we call concatenation, mm. that they try to link things together. Like you have one rule in which uh, this item comes up and then the same item comes up in the next rule, but it has another and that connects to the next. So there is a way of keeping things in sequence. Mm. Because this is another problem. One of the most uh, typical errors I find in comparative studies is uh, variations in sequence. And sometimes that is, it just doesn't matter whether you say first A or first B, but sometimes the sequence get lost, you lose the meaning. Yeah. Suddenly something stands out of context. There's a simile, and you're like, hey, what does this simile, this illustration have to do with this text? Yeah. And then you'll go, oh, the simile belongs early. It illustrates something quite different. Oh, now it makes sense. Very nice. They're very nice findings. And this again shows this is type of change. It's impossible for it to be intentional. Nobody would shift something to the wrong position. No. And it even shows how kind of like they were not fully thinking about the text while reciting, reciting. because that they didn't notice that it went into the wrong place. This also shows this inner integrity of the text is self-correcting in some ways when you, when you can see it. Oh, yeah. this one doesn't fit here. And it's almost like the text is correcting itself. It's very interesting. And... Also, you know, in the Tibetan monasteries, I know the young boys, they learn the text without knowing what the meaning is. That is. And that's, and that's, a, that's a system they use because that's a more accurate way of learning the text. Also, young minds as well, very good at mem- this memorizing. Is, this is Vedic recitation. That's yeah. the model of Vedic recitation. And also the, 
and sometimes this makes sense of the sutta. Like, for example, before when I read a, read a sutta and didn't know this, it's like, I think you mentioned, it's like a thesaurus, similar words. So similar, similar words are used in a row. And I used to think, oh, there must be some special reason. And I bet you there's a commentary that explains why this word. And now I understand that, no. This is because of the way the yeah. text was recorded. Yeah. And um, this is for, you know, v- veracity of the text. And actually, it's the general meaning that's important. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When we see such a group, uh, such a cluster of similar terms, we do not want to sit down and start to see what's the precise difference between the first and the second yeah. and the third. We want to get the general meaning mm. and understand that they are simply making sure that when the text was heard, at least one of these words stuck in the mind. Yeah. So this changes the way you read suttas when you understand why the form is like this. Even you mentioned there's a there's a case where normally we count one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's a count there's, and there's a sutta where it's like six then five. Yeah. Generally. And so you could like be scratching your head. Why? Why have we got six for five if you don't understand the reason? Yeah. And the reason is this. A cha and pancha. Exactly. So you have to say the shorter one before the uh, for the for the longer one. That's how they recite it: cha pancha, rather yeah. than pancha cha. Okay. I also thought when I was looking at that, reading your book, I thought uh, it's very smart as well because pancha cha. You might conflate those, and cha, six might get lost in the transmission because you're pancha cha oh, yeah. cha, and then That's you just true. go pancha, skipping cha, and so you end up. After a hundred years, just saying five, not five, six. I don't know what, what you think of that, but I was thinking there's, there's all these reasons. Yeah, yeah. I, hadn't, I hadn't actually thought of that possibility. But it's the law of boxing syllables that, that turns that around. Yeah. And I think what is really uh, good for all of us to take away when we are reading suttas, uh, read them aloud. Mm-hmm. Read them out loud. Yeah. So that you hear what you read. That's Even good advice. Even if it's in English. Really? In English? Read it out English, loud, yeah. Still, yeah, I have given this advice repeatedly to people and all of them come back with very positive results. Just reading it out loud makes you hear it and makes you be naturally more aware of the orality of these texts. Is it easier to memorize reading it out loud as well? Is there a help I'm, I'm talking now to a no. Western audience okay. who don't want to memorize, yeah. but who just have, like, say, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation of yeah. the Samyutta Nikaya, and there's a text that you find interesting, read it out loud. Mm. I mean, if you wish, you can even record it and then after listen to that recording. But even if you don't do that, just as the way of taking in the text, read it out loud. Mm. Because that activates the whole oral dimension for you. Mm. And there are texts like some of these repetitions. There's this one, uh, Mahasudasana Sutta, for example, that is... uh, a part of the Mahapari Nirvana narrative, the events leading up to the Buddha's passing away, this final Nirvana. And he gives this, 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 this story there of this king in a former time, and he had 84,000 chariots and 84,000 <laughs> of this, and there were golden trees with silver leaves and silver trees with golden leaves and lapis lazuli. And, la- and it goes on and on and on and on like that. If you, as a Westerner, sit down and read it, it's so boring. Mm. Once you understand this is a guided visualization, Got it. the whole thing completely changes. Yeah. We are indebted to Rupert Gethin for a very powerful article where he clarified that. Such an eye-opener. Mm-hmm. And particularly in the ancient Indian oral situation, they had no TV, they had no yeah. videos. Yeah. So something that brings up you, and then you start to visualize the golden tree with silver leaves, yeah. the silver tree with golden leaves, it becomes so entertaining. Suddenly this whole text takes up a completely different different atmosphere, it calls up interest, and the main message of that text comes out even more strongly. The message is, of course, to Ananda from the Buddha, hey, impermanence, mm-hmm. I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. And then he gives this beautiful visualization of this king with this glorious 84,000 here and that, yeah. also impermanent. Mm-hmm. So this monotonous text for some people suddenly becomes alive when you understand the way it was supposed to be read. Exactly. I love what you said. Reading it out aloud can activate the text for you. Yeah, it activates the text for you. It becomes yeah. something active. Mm. And the repetitions suddenly also make more sense. Mm. You, you, you feel a rhythm. 
This is something, it was crucial for my whole academic research into, into, into the suttas. That was just way back in Sri Lanka when I was doing my PhD on Satipatthana Sutta. And my friend Ruan, the one I uh, uh, wrote the rebirth book on, the oh, yes, yes, which yes. I had all this Pali. And I said to him, look, I have uh, started to memorize the Satipatthana Sutta because I want to approach my subject not only from the normal academic way, but also as something active. Uh, and yeah, and I'm skipping all the repetitions. No, one day, mm. don't do that. Recite them fully. Mm. I was like, oh, <laughs> not particularly happy about that. But when I did that, I suddenly realized that the repetitive parts were the most important ones. Of course they are, right? We would normally, like, that's missed. But of course, when you say it, of course the most repetitive parts are the most important parts. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but I would have missed out on that. And I don't know if I would have come to the understanding of Satipatthana that I have without this, 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 this shift of perspective yeah. from what the Western mind finds interesting, the changing parts, and this boring repetition, ya la la la, and then seeing that this is actually, this is the bone, Mm. And the other stuff is, is the meat and the, and, and the skin. But this is the bone of the instruction. Yeah, so when we're reciting in English, we should, often we say, same as before, we should go back and, and fill in, like say the complete thing. It is up to you. I yeah. mean, sometimes it can also be tiring. I'm just, just wanting to open the door to the understanding yeah. that sometimes what we abbreviate uh, may, be, may be quite important. Yeah. Just to leave the door open. Well, it's back to this uh, concept we started with, with self-reliance. Here are the options. See for yourself. Yeah, because if now you feel forced to uh, spell Precise. out everything, <laughs> it gets so boring that you might stop reading altogether. You might not start, right? Yeah. When it's like so long, <laughs> yeah, it's... you might not start. Um, yes, wonderful. So there seems to be you know, many wrong ideas that are being corrected about how the Buddha how we think um, these texts were transmitted. And so there's this idea that there was this early sort of more free period where people were like sort of talking about what the Buddha spoke. And then suddenly at some point it got formalized. But it seems that's not, that's not the full story, it seems. It seems yeah. it was mu there was much more intention around being very accurate from the very beginning. Is that I, true? This, this is the way I see it. And this is a typical problem of uh, a natural result of uh, projecting our own experience with writing. When I write an article, there's a period of free style, I'm changing things, writing, yeah. then I hand it in, then there's a little bit of formalization from the editor, and then it's out and finished. Yeah. So it is natural that as an academic coming from this experience, uh, and finding the differences between parallel versions and being in need to explain, I simply project that same experience. And so yep. I say, okay, there must have been a free improvisation period at the beginning, and then everything was formalized. Mm. But the actual evidence that I am presenting in the book speaks against that. Mm. There has been a concern with formalization accuracy from the beginning to the end. There has been a tendency for changes to happen from the beginning to the end. Yeah. It's a continuous process, both of them. And this is a dialogic kind of uh, interrelationship that you don't have it only early, don't have it only late. It's all the time there. Mm. The, the, the attempt to make it correct and accurate and the natural limitations of memory that counter that. Yeah. And we have to see this whole as an interrelationship that continuously influences the transmission of the text. Yeah. It also comes back to this worldview we have, not only of our own experience with writing and publishing, but also we are living in a world that does not have the confidence of the oral transmission that was previously, you know. So uh, in, the, in this time we're talking about, they were much more confident about, you know, the uh, integrity of the oral transmission. But we think it couldn't possibly, it must have been much more fluid. It was only oral. It was only um, spoken. So there couldn't have been the integrity of the written form. So there's a little bit of our bias looking back, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the problems when, if we think like that? What, what's the problem of thinking, oh, there was very loose early on and then it was formalized. Does that lead to any problems? Well, I mean, the, the, the issue is if we 
do not understand accurately how these texts came into being, how are we going to integrate them? Yeah. I think, and this is why uh, I suppose if you give out the title of the book, Early Buddhist Oral Transmission Box, so what? Yeah. Who wants to read that? Yeah. But actually, uh, it is really telling, and um, what I'm really trying to tell is what, what, what we actually really know about this oral transmission. Yeah. And, and so that, that really gives us the means to become self-reliant in, in working with these texts mm. and in teasing out their messages, in understanding what they mean. Mm. Yeah. And then um, I'm thinking about other sort of ideas we have that, you know, when I read your book, I, you know, I'm informed in a different way. So this idea that uh, for something to be legitimate, it has to have a Pali uh, reference. So if I find something in the in another oral tradition, but it's not in the Pali, then I can say, oh, that must come later. You shouldn't be confident in that sort of yeah, I take. Yeah, so, this, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, that? But this is simply an impression that came up because of the way the study of Buddhism developed in the West. Where at first they had uh, all these uh, mainly Mayana texts, on which like Bernouf and these people yeah. were working. And then when, uh, uh, particularly during the time of T.V. Rice Davis, when they came into contact with the uh, Theravada countries, they got this Pali material. And <clears throat> this seemed to be like uh, earlier, and then there came this like equation of like Pali is original and the other is late. But this is, uh, this can no longer be upheld. And it's, uh, there's of course a lot of Pali material also that is uh, later. But even just talking now about the discourses, we have these different transmission lineages that from India went to different parts of the world. And one of these went to Sri Lanka in a language that now we refer to as Pali, and which has the advantage of being a complete set of that particular recited tradition. So I, I, I still I, I love Pali, I recite in Pali, but there are other recited traditions that uh, some of them, what we find in Gandhari fragments, in Sanskrit fragments, we have a few in Tibetan translation, and quite a lot have been brought to China for translation. These are just as much authentic recitation transmissions of the early discourse as the Pali discourses. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if you have a discourse in Chinese, which is my main area of specialization, the Chinese Argonauts, mm -hmm. there is the problem of translation. And certain things like uh, the very fine philological work on like how this word changes to that, and this, this, you can't do that in the Chinese. And proper names is, is a headache in Chinese because you don't. It's very difficult to reconstruct what could have been the Indic original of a proper name in Chinese because they don't have the, they don't have letters. They have just these images. Yeah. But still, as far as teaching is concerned, uh, particularly the Chinese agamas can really help a lot to correct uh, Pali discourses. Yeah. So we cannot just opt for one tradition as the original. What we can only say is that the comparative study of these makes it possible for us to see developments over time periods and see what is comparatively earlier and what is comparatively later. Yeah. And this itself is very significant. I mean, we can see that like uh, in early Buddhism, the Buddha was not yet omniscient. This is a later development. The Bodhisattva ideal is a later development. This whole Abhidharma type of thinking is a later development. Momentariness we just yeah. spoke about. And there's, there's so many things where we can see from the comparative study the idea of the future Buddha Maitreya. Yeah. We have uh, uh, one version where he's not there at all. And then looking at the others, we see actually it's clearly a later edition. Mm. So this idea that the uh, historical Buddha Gautama could predict, ah, in the future time, there shall be a Buddha called Maitreya, and he will do this and that, is in fact a uh, little difficult to reconcile with the idea of conditionality and causality, that nothing is predetermined. So how is it possible to say in so, so many hundreds or thousands of years such and such person would say such and such thing is actually not really possible? Yeah, and um, knowing this is helpful, knowing, knowing that things came later is helpful because even when I was reading one of your other books on the mindfulness of breathing and the Buddha is coming out of retreat and finding that many of his monks have committed suicide 
And uh, based on a teaching he gave about, you know, the, uh, the way to meditate on the body. And so if you have this idea that the Buddha is omniscient, you're sort of like, when I read, read that, I was thinking, how, how, the, how does this happen? <laughs> this doesn't make sense. This story doesn't make sense. And so then if you have this other information, of course, there's uh, ways around that. Oh, the Buddha is just, you know, pretending and all this sort of stuff. But it's very helpful to know, okay, so omniscience, this, this story was told in a world where the Buddha was not considered omniscient. And then you say, okay, now, now I understand. Now I can get to the work of what was really being taught in that specific time. If that makes sense to you. Yeah, but even without omniscience, this is one of the most difficult stories. Mm. It is uh, uh, something rather significant for our overall topic because a tradition who considers the Buddha to be the supreme teacher of celestials and human beings to pass on that uh, uh, a recommendation, he didn't give a full teaching, just a recommendation, of Asura practice led to suicide of his students. Mm. I mean, uh, this is a very strong story. And so for the tradition to have continued that story and not suppressed it, says a lot about the fidelity of, of, yes. of the reciters. Mm. The story itself is, is difficult. I mean, if I would do that, I think that would kick me out here. Mm. If I would recommend something to you and then you would commit suicide, yeah. and that's just one person. Yeah. And then we'll say, like, Anna, you told Daniel it's good to do this practice, and he did that, and he commits suicide. Yeah. Oh, man, I mean, this is about the worst thing as a teacher I could do. Yeah. So the story itself has become, again, embellished in different Vinaya contexts. They, they make it more and more exaggerated. But the basic narrative nucleus still is the Buddha gives a recommendation of Asura, of the practice of seeing the non-attractiveness of the human body to newly ordained monks. And these become so lopsided in their practice that they commit suicide or have somebody kill them. Yeah. So, and that story is what we have in all versions, and we can't we can't uh, put that. Uh, so we can't story. say that's a later edition. No, the story yeah. itself is is there everywhere. We can't put it uh, hide it under the table somewhere. And so this is this is a very strong story. It shows the integrity of the transmission because. This is a rather inconvenient fact. <laughs> this is highly inconvenient. And so you would think that, you know, if there was this, if it was okay to do like innovation in this way where you could bring in another character who came and taught that to the Buddha's yeah. disciples yeah. and then the Buddha comes in and corrects, yeah. that would be quite easy to very, do. Of course. Very easy to do, exactly. But that didn't happen and that no, tells us something. That tells us something. But the story itself is simply... Uh, the way I read it is that uh, he, it, he gave the recommendation and not a full instruction. Mm. And he definitely was not omniscient at that point. He was also not really having the, I don't know, really knowing what was happening with this group. Mm. And the way I read it is like how easily you can be misunderstood. Because mm. obviously he was not intending in that story that they can commit suicide. And that at the end then he teaches them mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. Those who have not yet committed suicide, yeah, yeah. come, come here. <laughs> Something <laughs> that is very calm and peaceful, yeah. and <laughs> which is, as you you say, we think uh, it's reported that this was the Buddha's main form of meditation yeah. as yeah. well. So nice, so nice that we can know that in some way. Yeah. Yeah, and also it tells us something I think quite significant for the Western setting, because this New ordained monks now you go for the. Uh, you fight uh, your way to celibacy by working yeah. on this. And uh, instead, the more gentle mindfulness of breathing. And we have that particularly with Westerners, this tendency of like really uh, wanting to fight your way through. And that it's much better to, to, to go gradually and slowly and let the things grow like planting seeds and allowing them to grow instead of having this fight your way through attitude. This is like a secret instruction for Westerners, this relaxing, letting go. Yeah. Because, you know, especially mindfulness meditation and this sort of, I have to stay on the object type yeah, tightness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, as soon as people get instructed to relax a little bit, their meditation shines. Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. There's alternate ways of thinking about the transmission of early Buddhism. And I know there's a, a new book um, by Schumann. And I was wondering, 
you know, what you thought of his perspective in relation to ship to yours and how they differ and, and, and how you think about that. Yeah, and this is uh, Eviata Schulman, Visions of the Buddha. So he, his theory is, he refers to that as the play of formulas. He takes the formalized aspects of the discourses, which so far all scholars consider to be uh, uh, relevant to memorization. Mm. And he says, no, the main thing of this is not memorization, much rather these are the building blocks mm. out of which uh, the discourses were improvised. Mm. And then in order to uh, prove that theory, he then shows, look, this discourse, you see this formula, this formula, this formula, it was built out of these formulas. Mm. And the problem is that the mere existence of formulas does not prove that these were the building blocks. Mm. And so the example I have is like if I'm saying like, uh, you know, punctuation is the main way mm. of text being made. Mm. And so originally somebody just put a comma and here a colon and here an exclamation mark and afterwards they fill in the text to fill the space. And if you don't believe it, I pull out some books and look here, there, there, there's a comma, don't you see? There's an exclamation mark, there's a question mark. It doesn't mean the fact that these punctuations are there doesn't mean the punctuation was the original uh, way of constructing the text. And it's not completely wrong, particularly in those times before we used digital writing. I still did my university papers with a mechanical typewriter you have an idea of now I need to come to a comma somehow, now I need to come to a closure of the sentence. Yeah. You already know before you want to have a full stop or a period there and you adjust the words accordingly. So the idea of saying that punctuation has an influence on the writing is not completely wrong. But at the same time, taking to the extreme of saying like they first put the commas and the points yeah. and, and then fill it up with text is, is not, and makes as much sense as this theory. Yeah. It, it just doesn't make sense. And the problem, I think, is, and this is a general problem, uh, uh, underestimating the challenges of memorization. And so because of not seeing the need for these formulas and formula aspects to help memorization, uh, then there's this idea of coming up with another explanation for what the function of this is. And this... um, uh, underestimating of the challenges of memorization is particularly relevant to this particular book by Eviata Schulman because he repeatedly criticizes my work and I've already replied in an article also called Visions of the Buddha, a critical reply. Without exception, he misrepresents my position. And when I read that first, I was like, I mean, what are you doing? I mean, if, if you make me say something that I never said, it's very easy for me to reply. Yes. But then I saw he's also doing that to other scholars. Yeah. Like he will say, um, Norman is critical of this theory by uh, uh, this scholar, by Frau Wallner. And then he gives a reference. And you look up the reference, you find that Norman is actually supporting that theory, yeah. very opposite. And then I realized the problem is that he's not aware of the shortcomings of memory. Yeah. So he would have read quickly, formed some idea, yeah. written out, and never, never go back to check if what he remembers, me or Norman, whoever have said, if that's actually what they really said. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so this is really a, such a good warning. And this is something really relevant for all of us we need to be aware of the shortcomings of our memory. Because memory can seem so vivid and we are so convinced. But always go and check and always leave room open for the possibility that however accurate it may seem to me, however convinced I am, I remember exactly, Daniel, yeah. you said ABC. Yeah, yeah. And then you play it down and find, oh, you said DEF, wow. Yeah. Leaving, leaving open that, that, that space that our memory may not be accurate. We know this from eyewitness testimony and the problem exactly. with that. Yeah. Exactly. And these, these issues, two issues seem related. So this idea that um, the form comes first, right? 
that the punctuation comes first and the the words come second, uh, or that um, you can think about it like this: if I think of a glass of water, the glass exists because of the water. I want the water. It's not, and so to concentrate on the glass and then let the glass dictate how we think about the water is is the, is backwards actually. Yeah, yeah. And so why do we have a glass? Is because of the water. Why do we have the f- formations? It's because of the way recitation and memory works. Exactly. And so we shouldn't let that dictate um, yeah. how we think about the ideas. And so. The second issue with the uh, quoting or um, referencing of modern day scholars is a similar issue because it's related to this not understanding uh, how memory works. That, that's that's so the they're related problem. in a way, yeah. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't do it intentionally. Yeah. In fact, we had a good relationship before. I don't think he's like intentionally misrepresenting me. Yeah. And it's also it would also be a strategy that doesn't pay off because I reply and then he looks very bad. But it's just, it's just this, this, you can imagine, I mean, uh, he has many children and family mm. life and academic life and quickly reading something. Yep. And a few weeks later, you write about it. And when we are not aware of the shortcomings of our memory, then there is not this impulse of checking up again. Yeah. And the fact that we don't question our memory is so natural because that's what we are, no? Yeah, I who's, think this. Who is Daniel? Yeah, it depends. Depends on it's what I what remember. You remember <laughs> what you did in your life. Yeah, it's the whole sense of identity of Daniel is captured in this memory. Mm. Now, if I say, you know, the one you remember, you are, but your memory is not accurate. Mm. This goes at the very foundation of the sense of who we think we are. Identity can't exist without memory. Yeah. And um, I think this problem is getting worse, actually, it's because. We we have so much confidence in the written word that we rely less on our memory. And now we have the internet. And so, you know, we've had this theme running through our whole conversation about the importance of, you know, recitation, the confidence in memory based on recitation. And, oh, actually the understanding that we can't rely on memory so well, so we need to come together and recite. Now we have books. It's so individual. And we, we've lost this appreciation for how memory cannot be fully trusted. We need things in place to protect us from the problems with our own memory. Yeah. 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 Nice. And this is a place where mindfulness kicks in in the modern world. Because mindfulness is, is not the same as memory, but it has a close relationship to memory. It strengthens memory abilities. And so this whole working with mindfulness is really helping us to counter the overall tendency of the modern world to become more and more mindless, mm. forgetful. Yep. Click information, click clear, click there, already forgotten. Yeah. It, it's almost like momentary mind, momentary um, memory. Yeah. I, I remember for one yeah, moment that exactly, it's gone. Exactly. That's actually a good point. Yeah. 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 That's really the situation. And that is where my mindfulness and also mindfulness, uh, mindful recitation of the text for our own purposes can really help us to build up some resilience in facing those challenges. Mm. This is really informative for me. So it changes the way I think about receiving the Buddha's teachings. I remember being in the monasteries in India. I don't really want to go to the recitations. I'd rather stay in my room reading the books. That's changed today, actually. So thank you so much. Thank you very much.